Now we're going to talk about Ottonian manuscripts. Um, there's a relatively good survival of uh, manuscripts from the, uh, from the late 10th and 11th centuries. And we'll see here a sampling. The first one we're going to look at is called the Egberti Codex uh, because it was made for the Archbishop Egberti, whom you see here uh, on the dedication page. And you can see that this is uh, late 10th century. Uh, the way they're dating it is, is the years that he was the Archbishop, uh, from 977 to 993. The Archbishop Egberti was the imperial chaplain to Otto II at Tyr in Germany. And his name is associated with several manuscripts. And here we see him uh, with the, being larger than anybody else because he is the archbishop. So he's the most important figure here with this uh, high arctic scale. Uh, he's showing frontally, he's looking out at us, he's still alive. So he's, he's kind of claiming sanctity, but not completely. He has the square halo. You know, I'm a very holy guy, but I'm still alive. Uh, and uh, he is receiving the book. He's receiving this manuscript from one of the little monks uh, that are at his feet, or at his knees, I guess, really. Uh, you might notice also that uh, he has a lion-legged throne um, or seat, big soft cushions, and little lion heads coming out. Uh, and then the lion legs, uh, the lion paws on them, it almost looks like they're extending out from uh, Egbert. Uh, it's a kind of interesting decorative shape there. And then these wonderful arabesques uh, of foliage that uh, fill up the border. Uh, this is the picture from the Egberti Codex that is in your text. Uh, it is the Annunciation. Uh, it is when the angel Gabriel tells Mary that she is going to bear uh, the Christ child. Um, and and in, this, uh, and in this manuscript, in this codex, there are 50 New Testament scenes. Um, I don't have pictures of all of them, so we'll just see a few. Um, it has been suggested that there may be some Byzantine sources for this manuscript. Uh, for example, uh, notice the way the angel's wings rise up and uh, follow the lines of the halo, sort of embrace the halo. Uh, you see things like that in Byzantine uh, art. Um, and we remember that Otto II married Theophano, the Byzantine princess, and so there was uh, exchange with, uh, with Byzantium and the Ottonian Empire. Um, they had imports of Byzantine manuscripts uh, and, of course, luxury goods like ivories and silks, and it's quite possible that Byzantine craftsmen may have come to the West. There's probably also some Western influence here. Um, you can see the hand gesture, the very expressive hand gesture of the, of the angel. It, it might remind you a bit of, of some of the hand gestures you saw in the Utrecht Psalter. Not as sketchy, uh, but certainly you know, reaching out and, and giving you the sense of movement toward the other figure. You could probably call the Ottonian style expressive abstraction. Uh, certainly, there are some things that uh, do suggest uh, three-dimensionality. For example, here, the uh, angel's turning and the draperies wrapping his body. Uh, and there's a little uh, building or city. Is it the Temple of Jerusalem or is it the city of Bethlehem or Nazareth, uh, wherever uh, Mary received the angel? Um, be it's behind Mary. and. Uh, it's a bit more elaborate than some of the 5th century cities that we saw, or uh, even um, what the, um, or even the Joshua Roll uh, image, the M Joshua Roll image of Jericho, which was uh, basically walls with little, little, tiny buildings projecting up. Um, the colors are beautiful; they're very intense. You have these violet shades. Uh, you can see the the uh, shading of the sky. Uh, it's really a, a lovely play of uh, violets and pinks in this particular scene. Um, the gestures we've mentioned as being you know, particularly strong, uh, somewhat exaggerated gestures, uh, that conveys the tale, it tells the story. Uh, the angel is announcing to Mary that she will bear the Christ child. Uh, and you can look at the silhouettes of the figures as being relatively flat, although uh, 
you do have lines as drapery folds. Uh, there are outlines uh, that surround the figures and uh, uh, create the folds. And there's not very much shading. There's a little bit here uh, on the angel, uh, but mostly it's just line. Um, and to, just to show you uh, some other scenes that I found on the web uh, from the Codex Egberti. Uh, you have uh, the, uh, you have Christ in Gethsemane, uh, the agony in the garden. Uh, you see the rest of Christ with uh, Judas uh, kissing Christ. Uh, you see the Massacre of the Innocents. And this particular scene was not identified, so I am not sure which scene it is. There's a, a number of scenes where you might have a woman uh, bowing. She's hunched over. Uh, and uh, Christ, once again, this you know, very large gesture that comes out, and then the drapery fold parallels it. Um, there's a woman, for example, that healed a woman with the influx of blood. Uh, or it, it could be, I mean, I, I can think of a whole lot of images that it could be, and, and I you would have to see it in the text to know what it is. Uh, another work from about this time, from the 980s, uh, 983 to 87, is the Registrum Grigori. Now, the Registrum Grigori uh, is a collection of letters uh, that were written by Pope Gregory I, or Gregory the Great, who lived uh, in the 6th century, just a little bit into the 7th century. He died in uh, 604. Um, and he was very quickly canon, well, it was very quickly declared a saint. Um, unfortunately, the whole manuscript doesn't exist. In fact, the only thing left of it are simply two, uh, the only thing left of it, or at least anything left of the pictures, are two leaves. Uh, one you see here, uh, which is in the Stop Bibliothèque in Tyr, uh, and it is uh, St. Gregory uh, composing or dictating uh, a text. And uh, the other one we'll see shortly, and that is Otto II Enthroned. And that page is in an entirely different collection. It's in Chantilly in France in the Musée Condé. Now, I think I told you the story before when we were uh, looking at the Met Sacramentary. Um, the story was that Pope Gregory would dictate from behind a curtain. And the scribe, who was a monk, I was very curious about that, so he, he peeked. You know, he said the Pope would be dictating along and then he would stop. And then he'd start again. So what's going on when he stops? So he, he peeks and he sees the dove of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and here we see the dove of the Holy Spirit uh, whispering to Pope Gregory. So he's he's got to pause and learn what the Holy Spirit is moving him to say. Uh, so this is showing that he is divinely inspired. Uh, this is also another work that is, uh, this is also another work that was commissioned by the Archbishop Egberti. There are two Gospels that are called the Gospel of Otto III. Uh, the first one, you're, sometimes they talk about the Aachen Gospels of Otto III and the Munich Gospels of Otto III. Uh, your, book dis, uh, your book makes an, another distinction. Uh, it calls the one from Aachen the Lutar Gospels of Otto III. Now, Lutar is a name that is inscribed in the manuscript. And some people think that he is the scribe. And uh, different uh, manuscripts with a similar hand, they will assign to Lutar. Uh, other people think that perhaps it's a donor rather than, uh, you know, or someone who uh, gave the book or commissioned the book, uh, rather than uh, the scribe. The manuscript is in the Aachen Cathedral Treasury. The other one is in the Munich Staatsbibliothek. One of the things that I like students to think about, sometimes I'll use it as an essay question or a um, discussion question, is the way that imperial imagery borrows from Christological imagery. We see Otto III enthroned, and we're going to take a good look at that. And then down at the bottom of the page, you see two figures in secular dress and two figures in clerical dress. And so these would represent the church and state. If you look at this, 
So let's look at some of that Christological imagery. What do I mean by that? It's images that are appropriate to Christ. Uh, we have, for example, the hand of God reaching down and crowning Otto III, uh, rather like the hand of God reaches down to uh, pull Christ up in the ascension uh, or to bless Christ at the baptism or other scenes. Um, we have seen, however, the hand of God crowning uh, other emperor uh, in the Carolingian manuscripts. But here, Otto is actually enclosed in a mandorla. Uh, mandorla comes from the Latin word for almond. And it's a, an almond-shaped halo that goes around the whole body. So uh, we see that associated with Christ very often. Thinks about those uh, images that we've seen of Christ in glory or Christ in majesty. And then if you look at the base of the throne, it looks like there's a, a woman who's holding it up and like it's balancing on her. Uh, this actually is a personification of the earth. It's a Terra or Gaia. Uh, so the very earth is supporting uh, the throne of Otto. He is, he is supreme over all the earth. Uh, and then, I'll take a look at those. Uh, we see that uh, surrounding Otto are the four living creatures who surround the throne of God in uh, the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, in the vision of Ezekiel, and that is, of course, the winged man, uh, the winged ox, the winged lion, and the eagle. And uh, they surround the throne of God and they sing, Sanctus, 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 Holy, Holy, Holy. And as we know, uh, they became symbols of the four evangelists. So what are they doing there next to the emperor? Uh, he literally is taking on the attributes of Christ. Uh, while we're looking at the detail, you might also notice that he is holding the orb and cross. Uh, Christian emperors always seem to do that. Uh, it shows their dominion over the earth and uh, uh, I suppose Christ's dominion over the earth as well. On either side of Otto's throne, or on either side of Gaia, are two uh, crowned figures who then presumably are emperors. And uh, there's no labels to tell us who they are, so some people think they might be uh, Otto III's two predecessors, his father and grandfather, Otto I and Otto II. Other people suggest that it could be Constantine, the first Christian emperor, or Charlemagne, uh, the, uh, the Frankish, uh, well, the term Holy Roman Emperor hadn't come yet, but the Emperor of the West, uh, who reunited uh, Europe. And of course, the Ottonian uh, emperors feel they're doing the same thing, that they are reuniting uh, Europe, uh, although their territory is uh, slightly less than Charlemagne's. There's a book, uh, a concept, called The King's Two Bodies. And you'll see that there is a scroll or a banderole uh, that is held by the living creatures, and it divides the emperor into two parts. We see his head and shoulders uh, above the scroll, and below we see the lower body. And this is supposed to represent the two types of authority, perhaps, that the king has. Uh, his head and soul receive divine investiture. He is the representative of God on earth. And then we have his torso and the lower body. Well, he's also a secular ruler. He doesn't preside only over spiritual matters. He also presides over earthly matters. The inscription uh, says, uh, which is on the opposite page, it says, may God invest your heart with this book. Otto Augustus. So it's Otto the, Otto the August, Otto the Great. And uh, you may remember that uh, back, at, uh, uh, back in the first century uh, BCE, uh, the first Roman emperor who actually reigned uh, was uh, Augustus Caesar, but his name was Octavian, and he took the title of Augustus. So he is taking this imperial Roman title of Augustus. And then, as we mentioned, the figures at the bottom have uh, uh, clerics and soldiers. And then you see uh, the figures at the bottom represent church and state uh, by having uh, two soldiers and two clerics. I promised you another leaf 
from the Registrum Grigori. And uh, so here it is. This is a page showing Otto II enthroned. And uh, we also have from the Gospels of Otto III in Munich, uh, a picture of the enthroned uh, Otto III. Now, you'll notice that there are uh, two people on either side of each emperor. Um, they're somewhat different people. The uh, young ladies uh, who are crowned and holding out, it looks like uh, golden orbs, uh, to Otto II are the four parts of his empire. And you'll see besides Otto III, uh, we have clerics and uh, secular figures. We have the sword, so uh, warriors. Uh, noble class perhaps. So once again the emperor is showing his authority over the over the church with the clerics and over the secular realm uh, with the uh, warriors here, the soldiers. You might notice that both of them are holding an orb and cross but in this case the cross is inscribed on the orb. Uh, that, of course, shows his dominion over all the earth and uh, also reminds us that the emperor is Christ's representative on earth. Uh, there is no separation of church and state. That is a very unusual thing um, to, to happen, actually. Uh, so uh, don't ex definitely don't expect that in the Middle Ages. Um, and I guess I should tell you that uh, in the 12th century particularly, uh, there is... A great controversy uh, going on in the in, they're going on in medieval Europe uh, about uh, who should invest bishops. It's called the investiture controversy, and there are other controversies about uh, whether the king should preside over uh, the church. The church is trying to say that they are independent, that they, they are equal, or they are actually uh, in authority over the king because they, they should deal with spiritual matters. And of course the emperors aren't having any of that. So um, there is a, a long controversy about it in, in the future. Um, the Carolingian and the Ottonian emperors for the most part uh, uh, seemed to get along rather well with the church. They supported the church and they also provided military protection uh, for Rome. You'll notice that they are seated in what I've called a spatially ambiguous architectural setting. Uh, Otto II, is he in front of this canopy? Well, it kind of looks like it, but shouldn't he be under his canopy? Uh, and yet the, uh, the front of the uh, throne uh, seems to be in the foreground, as though he is coming out at us. Uh, and yet uh, we follow the columns up and it looks like uh, the ark uh, is behind him, so it's it's uh, it's got all the parts, but it's somewhat ambiguous. Uh, and uh, then we see Otto III uh, once again, you know, really close to us up in the picture, playing with the 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 very feet of his throne at the edge of the uh, illustration. Uh, he has a architectural setting of tile roof, gables, and a um, and, and a cloth, a uh, curtain hanging down behind him. Um, I know later on uh, there are uh, what they call cloths of honor uh, hanging behind, for example, the, the Virgin Mary in 15th century paintings. Um, so I don't know if that's the early part or if it's simply a way uh, to block off the space to give you a suggestion. Yes, there is something behind him, but I don't have to paint the whole picture, <laughs> the whole room. Um, you might notice these uh, wonderful uh, capitals that have the foliage and these little heads popping out. Uh, taking quite a few liberties uh, with the uh, classical form, uh, that's not the point. They are not interested in doing that. Um, and I guess you can have a little bit of fun even when you're drawing the emperor. You can stick it in your columns maybe. Uh, they're very frontal, both of them. Uh, they're very linear. Uh, although their, fa their uh, knees are supposed to project forward, uh, particularly with Otto III, you really have a sense that he's, he's completely flat. And of course they are created uh, with line. Well, let's look a little more at Otto III. Let's look at the context. Um, that is not just a 
page that doesn't have any other pictures, there is a facing page. And so these two images, when you would open the book uh, to folio 23 verso and 24 recto, to be very exact, um, when you would open this book, you would see the two images together. And what you see uh, is what was, um, we thought was missing. Uh, instead of uh, having the four parts of the empire uh, right next to his throne, they are processing, they are coming to pay homage to Otto III. And they're bearing gifts. Uh, and they're all, pers the, all the parts of the empire are personified uh, as uh, uh, young ladies uh, with uh, veils and crowns and uh, bearing riches to the emperor. And you can see how art is becoming uh, more hierarchical, if you will, or hieratic. Uh, it's a very symmetrical picture. Uh, and of course, uh, you have this extremely large figure because, once again, the emperor is the important guy. Uh, but he does seem flattened. And uh, there are there is indication of space, like the figures who overlap each other, and yet uh, uh, there is a greater abstraction here in Ottonian art uh, than, say, in some of the Carolingian art. The regalia of the emperor is emphasized. We have uh, an eagle on his scepter. We have lion heads on his throne. Um, and that might very well be a reference to the very wise king uh, Solomon, David's son, who was supposed to be the wisest king of all, and he was supposed to have had a throne with lion heads on it. Uh, and so, uh, and so you have, uh, in a sense, uh, you have, in a sense, perhaps the emperor claiming the wisdom of Solomon, uh, just by this little uh, attribute. Of course, he's wearing a crown, and his uh, garment is purple. And of course, we also already mentioned uh, the orb and cross. Now let's look at one of the most exciting, and it really is, exciting images in the Gospels of Otto III. There are, of course, uh, four evangelist portraits. I've only been able to find pictures of two of them to show you. Um, but we'll take a good, clear look at this, and then a shorter look at the other one. Uh, this is St. Luke, and of course you know it's St. Luke because, I mean, even though you don't have the page and can look and see that the next page is the Gospel of St. Luke, you see him with his evangelist symbol in this great circle up above his head uh, is a, a very active uh, flying ox with a scroll. Uh, and we see a lot of uh, what uh, decorative animal forms here. Uh, the uh, image of the saint and we'll talk about those, uh, the, the, it looks like he's doing a balancing act. Uh, we, we'll, we'll talk about what he's got above his head in a moment. Um, but if we look at the sort of framework around it, uh, there's an architectural framework with uh, very fantastic decorations, uh, sort of the two pods for the capitals and uh, animals in the, uh, the ark itself. And then of course it looks like uh, two birds maybe not sure what they are, <laughs> but it looks like two birds, uh, maybe they're quail, uh, but at any rate, up in the spandrels or the corners. Down below, you see uh, two deer, and we'll talk about them in a minute. The background is gold leaf, it's gilded, uh, which of course, it, 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 this is a very rich manuscript. It was made for the emperor. But I say this was very exciting. What you have is the saint. Uh, in a mandorla uh, on which seems to be a rainbow. It reminds you once again of Christ in majesty. Um, and his arms are raised up. His eyes are large and staring. And above him are all these circles. You know, I wonder whether it was suggested by Ezekiel's vision where he talks about a wheel within a wheel. I don't know. Maybe it was. But at any rate, you have this love of geometric forms that appears in Artonian art uh, and is an organizing principle in so many Artonian manuscripts. Um, we have gospel books that are heaped in the saint's lap. Uh, evidently, it's uh, evidently when you're writing a codice and you're writing on parchment, it's, it's going to be very thick. Uh, or maybe, there's, maybe those are his reference books. But at any rate, you see books heaped on his lap. Uh, and then you see these circles. 
that contain uh, various images. Uh, the ox, who is the symbol of the evangelist, is, is up uh, front and center at the circle that uh, uh, repeats the circle of the saint's halo. And then you have uh, faces. Uh, those faces are the prophets. And then uh, in the outer reaches, you have angels. So this is certainly an amazing, a heavenly kind of vision. Uh, and like we mentioned the wide eyes of the saint um, taking on sort of spiritual uh, images. It really is imparting that idea of divine of divine inspiration. And let's look at something where we've seen the iconography before. Uh, at his feet, there are two uh, rivers of water uh, coming from the, uh, uh, from the evangelist. Um, and you have, uh, at the very feet of the evangelist, two rivers flowing forth with deer uh, drinking from them. And that may remind you of Psalm 42, 1. As the heart, the deer, as the heart panteth after the fountains of water, so my, so my soul panteth after thee, O God. So it refers to the soul's thirst for God and for the thirst for the true word of God in the Gospels. Now, I said, you've seen that iconography before, so I'm going to remind you where you saw it. Uh, there was a beautiful mosaic uh, in the mausoleum of Gala Placidia showing uh, stags here with the antlers drinking from the living waters. So the heart or the stag uh, becomes a symbol of the soul thirsting for the living waters of Christ. Uh, and so here we see it in 5th century Ravenna, and we see it again, 500, more than 500 years later. We see it, and we see it again about 550 years later in the Gospels of Otto III. So we see it in the 5th century mosaic, and we see it about 550 years later in the Gospels of Otto III. Uh, here is St. Matthew. It's the same general format. Uh, it doesn't have quite as much detail as St. Luke does, but uh, uh, just very, very interesting. Once again, you have a uh, decorative archway uh, that is embellished, in this case, with uh, a kind of ribbon-like design. Uh, and animals, uh, little bunny rabbits, up in the spandrels in the corners. And instead of the deer, you have two men human beings uh, drinking the living waters. Uh, so it's almost like, okay, we have our symbol and now we'll show you, you know, that human beings actually thirst for these living waters. Um, instead of the almond-shaped body halo, we have a round uh, body halo as well as a round halo around uh, the saint's, uh, saint's head. And he is once again uh, seated on the rainbow like Christ. Uh, for some variation, we've got uh, the evangelist symbol. Uh, for variation, we've got uh, the other figures in the uh, uh, circles, uh, both above and below uh, St. Matthew. Uh, he can be identified by his uh, symbol, uh, the winged man or angel here holding the scroll right above his head. And then once again, we see prophets both above and below, and uh, they are surrounded with angels. In this case, uh, Matthew is not supporting uh, all of those great circles above, uh, but his hands are raised in wonder, awe, praise. And here you see a close-up of uh, Matthew, and you see he's labeled. No, they have his. They have his name. It says math. They're not talking about arithmetic, uh, abbreviation for Matthew. I'd also like to show you another page that I did have a very good illustration of. And uh, this is from the Gospels of Otto III, the one in Munich that we've been looking at. 
I wanted to show you another page from the Gospels of Otto III. This is one that's frequently illustrated, and I did have a very good uh, illustration. Uh, it's showing a more narrative scene. Here we see uh, the washing of the feet, or Christ washing his disciples' feet. Uh, actually, it's not the moment when he's actually doing the washing, uh, but uh, it's part of the story. Before the Last Supper, Christ showed his humility uh, by washing the feet of his disciples. And St. Peter was just horrified of that. You know, Christ shouldn't be washing my feet. He said, no, no, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing this. You know, this, you should be doing this menial task. Uh, and Christ says to him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And then Peter gets all excited. He says, well, then wash my hands and my face. Wash all of me. <laughs> See, Peter does like to carry things to extremes occasionally. Um, so there is certainly symbolic. There's, there's a whole lot of things going on. There's the humility of Christ. Um, trying to uh, uh, teach a, a sort of symbolic act in a sense. And then talking about cleansing uh, symbolically, you know, that the, the uh, apostles must uh, cleanse their souls, perhaps, as well as their feet. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can interpret this. Uh, but it is showing the moment when uh, Peter's put his foot in the, uh, the uh, vessel that contains the water. Uh, but uh, I guess he's asking Christ to, to wash all of it. And Christ, who is right there in the center with a uh, this is a cloth of honor that is gilded and gold hanging down behind him. Has that very long arm and uh, expressive gesture that we've seen before. It's a reaching out. Uh, and the gestures are a way, I think, of increasing the narration. You have a feeling as though uh, they're actually communicating and talking to each other. Uh, you might notice, of course, that we do have uh, the city of Jerusalem uh, uh, sort of uh, either suspended above or possibly behind uh, the cloth of honor. And other apostles, uh, some uh, lined up behind Peter. And uh, here we see uh, the Christ uh, and Peter's gesture. And you can see that you have very, very clear outlines. And even the shading, uh, such as it is, is handled uh, with li linear brushstrokes, if you will. And uh, here you have a detail of uh, two of the apostles who are uh, preparing to have their feet washed. Uh, one is bringing a basin, and the other is untying his sandals. And it's uh, a, a very active gesture. I mean, he's, he's foreshortened. Uh, they're, but they are both looking toward Peter and Christ, so the focus is on them. But uh, it's kind of delightful to have a little... Uh, Little guy taking off his sandals, actually.